Hi, this is Tamsin Granger. This is Dan Abuhoff. And with Tamsin and Dan, read, read the, the paper. paper. And today we have, as a special guest, once again, Sadie, Sadie Abuhoff. That's right, Sadie Abuhoff. And we're here, it's December 30. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is what we've been doing over this uh, Christmas holiday week, which includes a, a movie and a play and a big sporting event. And then we're going to talk a little bit, little bit about the future, uh, including... We have been reading the paper, too. That's why we know about that's the future. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> the future in the form of flying cars. So you want to hear about flying cars, which are on the horizon. But first, uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, Japanese Christmas, because it's a little bit different in Japan. Isn't well, it? We're, we're still, you know, hanging over from our celebration <laughs> of hang, Christmas. We're hanging on and hanging over. Yeah. I mean, we could do what everybody else is doing and, like, sum up the year. No, we're not doing that. But uh, that, for me, has gotten a little bit uh, let's, tiresome. Let's talk about Japan. Japan. Uh, Wall Street Journal article. Uh, this weekend, finger licking festive, and it describes uh, the Japanese celebration of Christmas. The Japanese may have hit upon the ultimate holiday menu, reads uh, the uh, headline: fried chicken and a strawberry shortcake with champagne, of course. Of course. What a way to kick off the new year! And there's a slogan. In Japan, if it's Christmas, it must be Kentucky. <laughs> Is that really? Yeah. Apparently, fried chicken came, the Kentucky fried chicken came to Japan in 1970. And one of their early campaigns yeah. was a combination of KFC and a bottle of wine. Really? Around Christmas time. Mm, mm. Um, and it became an integral, integral part of the Japanese Christmas tradition. Now, this is the thing. Less than 1% of the population in Japan is Christian. Okay. Okay. But uh, as a part of Japan opening up to the West in the 19th century, uh, they did, uh, you know, be, you know, adopt to some extent the secular uh, celebration of Christmas. It starts out as a children's holiday with toys uh, in the early 20th century, but then after World War II, it takes hold as a celebration for adults, complete with wine and cake. And uh, actually, um, when uh, the uh, writer of this article, Gabriella Gershenson, asks a Japanese friend about Christmas, uh, what people do in Japan, uh, she asks a friend, and her friend explains, yes, on Christmas, they do feast on fried chicken with champagne and Christmas cake, usually strawberry shortcake. Then your boyfriend takes you to a love hotel. Okay, well, I think that's it's, self-explanatory. It's uh, it's kind of a Valentine's Day. Yes, it uh, is. In it's Japan. Romantic, yeah. So that's kind of funny. And uh, so they do indeed eat uh, Kentucky fried chicken well, or, you know. DIY, make your own fried chicken. Well, uh, perhaps that's a little better. And the Wall Street Journal gives a recipe for Japanese fried chicken and Japanese uh, strawberry shortcake made with uh, a very light combination of cake flour and cornstarch. Yes, well, now that you mention it, as it happens, we were in a hotel on Christmas Day because uh, we decided to uh, see a play. We saw a network. And we all, uh, this was the 25th, and we went to the play, and we stayed in a hotel that night. Uh, and it, it probably is worth remarking, and this is all three of us, had the experience of walking to the play from the hotel, which is from the east side, a little bit to the west, in the 40s, uh, through a mob, through a group of, a large number of people of, of the size I've never encountered before in New York. Well, it was a little scary. It was very scary. If we had thought about it for five minutes... Uh, we would have realized. In fact, Sadie said, uh, Sadie start, started our walk uh, down Madison, and I said, no, no, no. Let's walk down Fifth Avenue yeah. and see Look, the sights. But quite apart from our choices, which weren't the greatest, and we have been in crowds before. We were experienced crowd like people. This. But like it was, scary is the right word. It was a mob. It was not moving forward neither, in any direction at one point. You no, couldn't no, no, go no, no, forward no. or Look, backwards. We were stuck. We were stuck, and... Nobody was moving forward, but the crowds continued to condense right. and move towards Surging. us from the back. Right. And so we were getting more and more trapped. Yeah. So uh, the moral of the story is, 
that if you want to go to New York on Christmas, don't go to New York because we would like to go to New York and we don't want you to be there. <laughs> That's right. Look, we had no, I we was totally like more unprepared. space. Yeah, it was, look, I haven't and been in a situation like that. It was pretty bad. The intensity of the crowd. This was around like St. Patrick's yeah. and Saks and Rockefeller Center, uh, the big train. About seven in the evening. Yeah. And it was uh, a brutal. And even when we squished our way, slithered our way over mm. towards the theater district, mm. It was still, it was very busy. Yeah, but it wasn't it was jam-packed. Like, it was crazy. It was so, good not to be driving. But we got to uh, the play, thankfully, on time. We gave ourselves plenty of time, and we saw Network. Uh, Network, which is the uh, play that's uh, based on the movie Network, written by Ch- Patty Chayefsky, and starring Brian Cranston in a limited engagement. And it's a story of a network executive, uh, again, first written for the movies in the 1980s, uh, who's a uh, basically a news reporter. He's a news anchor. And at a certain point, he kind of throws his hands up in the air and he says, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Well, everybody knows that uh, iconic line. That's the iconic line. So the question is, does the play work quite beyond the iconic line? It's interesting being in a play where you feel you know the punchline. But uh, I thought the play did work. What do you think? Yes. Okay. Well, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can move <laughs> Well, Give me a little all right. More. So again, so it's it's a play that never existed as a play. Right. It was a movie. Yeah. It's made into a play. Right, right. Okay. There are two main plot lines: one to do with the Brian Cranston character, right. and then a sort of love interest thing right. on the side. And the Brian Cranston, as it says in the reviews, was fabulous. Fantastic. He's the whole play. He is the whole play. And the other, the side. Didn't yeah, work. No. Zero. So what do you think, Say? I thought it was good. I thought it was interesting the way they staged it because not only did they have TV screens and larger screens than TV screens on the um, the stage to show what they were showing on TV and or different pieces of the stage to the audience. They also had audience members sitting on stage, which I feel like might be kind of a new... I don't know if it's a new trend, but we've seen it a few times over the last few years. Um, so there were a lot of components going on, a lot of things, different things happening on stage, and you had to keep um, an eye out for the TV, the TVs around the um, audience and then on the stage to figure yeah. out what was happening. And then also there were moments where they were interacting with the audience, so there was always the big... Um, uh, question of whether the the audience members would answer the questions correctly because they were kind of asking questions in a way that you would think they would know the answer but you never know yeah no, well, not only were there people seated on the stage watching the production they were actually eating dinner right they were being <laughs> served uh, a full right. course well, meal we, we've seen and something like that but yeah but not, not dinner but not in, dinner. In Copenhagen uh, years ago, we had there were people on the stage. We no, and we've, and we've well, seen and the, other the other great, productions. The Great Comet, they had people on stage. Yeah, that's Great probably, Comet's a good example. Probably drinking from the bar or oh, something yes. like that. Oh, yes, Russian vodka. But, you know, so the staging's gotten a lot of attention. It's uh, Ivo uh, von Hova, who, as we were discussing before, is from Belgium but works in Amsterdam. He's become a very famous director. Uh, he's really sought after a great deal. He had his big production in New York. Uh, that won a lot of awards was A View from the Bridge, the Arthur Miller play a few years ago. We learned from Sondheim last week that he's... Well, Sondheim <laughs> spoke of him rather breathlessly. Glowingly. Yes. They, said, they said to him, well, what do you feel about somebody restaging West Side Story? He said, well, it's Ivo von Hova. So what am I going to say? It's going to be great, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, that puts him on a fairly high level. And he's he's responsible for the kind of immersive staging Sadie was describing. It To me, it was interesting because Network, when it came out in the 80s, was shocking because the the notion of um, it, well, let me take a half step back. At that time, your network news anchors, like the Walter Cronkites, were like gods. Everything that came out of their mouths was definitely true. They weren't questioned. They were considered author- authoritarian figures, and uh, they weren't controversial in any way. And so now you had a movie depicting a a network anchor who went completely off the rails and really questioned what those network anchors were all about. And that was the shock value then. Now you're in 2018. People are way past that. No one gives the network anchors that much credit anymore, so there has to be more going on. And there were moments in this play early on when I said, I don't know if this play has that much more to offer. 
Uh, and then it built up and it built up and Cranston just is amazing. And at a certain point, I found myself totally carried away. Thought it was a great performance and certainly worth seeing. Yeah. So and the I technology it. was fun. It was fun. And uh, kind of helped it, it you know, flesh it all out. It helped sustain Because you it. could, uh, not where we were sitting, we yeah. had odd seats, but uh, you could see like the, um, what would you call it, the... Uh, programming booth yeah and uh you could see at one point they're actually doing kind of a live remote yeah. with two characters walking down the street right live outside well, the that, theater that's, that's the great thing about theater because that stuff was great and yet if you ask me the most affecting moments in the play is when brian cranston literally sat down on the stage and talked to the audience right uh, uh so it, it was this mix of technology i found myself saying the next day that what I saw was the best movie I've seen all year, uh, even though it was a play. It was strange. But then, so it's great. And then we saw, uh, later in the week, just yesterday, we saw Mary Queen of Scots. And uh, what do you think of Mary Queen of Scots, Aid? I thought it was better than The Favorite. <laughs> well, it was better than The Favorite. That's for sure. Uh, well, it's it, another period historical drama right. piece, um, but done more uh, traditionally. Well, yeah, that's true. First well, of all, we should say who it's starring because you can pronounce this better than I can. Saoirse Ronan okay. and Mar Margot Robbie. And and directed by Josie Rourke, is that the name? Right. Right. Um, and so you I think what's interesting about this is that it was like a combination of a lot of different types of movies because it was a period piece, but it wasn't all about... Like, when I think of period pieces, I think about things like The Favorite or... Like, you know, something happening in Versailles or something like that, where it's like a lot of court politics and just a lot of people, fancy people walking around and love triangles, et cetera, et cetera. But this had a lot more actual, like, battles, and I just felt like it was a little more, I don't know, less polished and in court and more, like, these people were, you know... I don't want to say living in the real world, but it was just a little different. It was right. different scenery because they were in Scotland and in England, and the queens were actually, instead of being in fa fancy coaches, they were riding in front on a horse, leading their men into battle. So it was like a slightly, since I guess it was a little more toward the medieval time period, it was a little more, right. um, I don't know. I mean, it was wrong, more maybe. natural. It was more a history pick. It was more trying to show the way things really were. It was less degree. of the, the fancy Renaissance and right, right. that right. period. Although the, the, the favorite, I think they're making the point that these people do, in many ways, are absurd. Oh, yes. Uh, no you know, they were doing absurd things. I, I understand you know? that. Um, and so, whereas the favorite does that in a very uh, kind of... Outward fashion. Yeah. This, you know, we're supposed to look at a more historical presentation and right. understand it's all crazy. You okay. know, these people deciding well, they're that, crazy religious fanatics. You know, yeah, sure. that you know that God has given them the right to be queen over everything. Right. Uh, you know. Well, and it, we're supposed to understand that's absurd. It's that, but it's also the whole charade of you have the women leading the countries, but they're really just at the mercy of what their council is telling them and whoever in their council is the most um, persuasive or has developed the best relationship with them. And so it's really and, and, they're kind of like be, a that, puppet of a lot of the, it, the senior men that they're dealing that with. That may be realistic and historically accurate. Yeah. I suspect that At might a certain be. point, they decide, the men decide to murder people, and they do, and uh, the women are stuck yeah. with the result. But uh, is this one where the screenplay was by Bo Willimon? Yes, it is. It is. Okay, so so there was a little more emphasis House of cards. on House of Cards, Mr. House of Cards. Right. So there's a an emphasis on, uh, I think, drama and power, yeah. and a little bit of uh, you know speechifying yeah. to some extent, right. which is funny because once again, even though we think we understand English, we don't really understand English or Scottish. Or whatever they're all speaking. Uh, didn't you find that occasionally the the brogues were pretty? Oh, thick? I, I did pretty well with that. Look, I, I think that uh, we should all say Willemann did the Parisian Woman too, which we saw this year. The the you know Hollywood used to make a movie like this every year or every few years. I mean, not exactly like this, but the kind of historical thing we're talking about: movies with Catherine Hepburn, with Vanessa Redgrave, with Betty Davis going way back. All these people would, would play 
Vanessa was uh, Mary Queen of Scots. The others played Queen Elizabeth. I mean, this is a standard type of Hollywood movie in a sense. And frankly, those movies were honored. Many of them won Oscars. In my mind, this movie stands up to those movies. I mean, this movie was very well done. Right. Uh, it's not my favorite type of movie, but it was extremely well done. And I was very but impressed by it. it's still a fantasy. It's still, it's still our like... fantastic vision of how these things work. Yes, but I thought I... it was also interesting, though, that they did have a multicultural cast yeah. and just paid no mind to it. It was like they had... Right, they right. They had... Asian Americans who were being the the ma- the ladies in waiting. Well, we don't know they were. Were they American? They had, I think, Asian something of Asian descent. I don't yeah. know, but you saw different colors yeah. of people playing the different roles, and it was just not you know identified at all. It was just like these people are right. ladies in waiting, or these people are counsel to the. Well, it was also modern. Queen. I thought Ronan played it uh, had a modern take on Mary Queen of Scots. She was. She was very much uh, self-possessed. She was imbued with power. She exercised her power. She had a very high opinion of herself. And at the same time, she was a young woman with limitations. Um, and she ran it headlong, headstrong into those limitations. It, w- it was very interesting. I but think. let's be clear. What? None of us know enough about the real history. To oh, know of course not. We have the slightest idea. Or, or whether it makes I any mean, sense. But I just think if you are married, if you're from Scotland and you're married off to someone in France and you're like ruling in France and then you get sent back to Scotland. I feel like you're kind of a worldly person at that point and you're willing to tell people what to do. And I feel like that's where she is. Um, she, you know, she's been around a few countries. She knows how to speak a few languages. So she has that perspective and she can kind of, she was very persuasive. She has the confidence to talk down to people a little bit. <laughs> well, true. the one thing I do know, she was married her first marriage. She was 16. Yeah. She's widowed by the time she's 18. Yeah. Yeah, but the fact that she had been to France, had that marriage, spent two years in France, et cetera, et cetera, that's a huge experience for someone who's a teenager. Right. So ha- having come back to Scotland and having had that well, experience. So in other words, after your junior year abroad, you're per- per- perfectly prepared <laughs> to be to queen. Rule well, the to world. be queen. There's no question she about it. She was royalty in France for two years. I think that gives her some experiences. Right. I don't I s- think she's. I don't think it means that she's able to rule the world. I mean, it means that she's, All you know, right. a little bit more seasoned. Can we agree we recommend the movie? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And the other thing that we did was we went to uh, a sporting event. We went to a hockey game. We went to uh, a Princeton a uh, hockey game against Maine at the famous Hobie Baker rink. And uh, that was in the middle, I forget, that was Thursday or Friday, Friday night. Uh, and we get there. It's a wonderful little rink, um, collegiate style. Uh, and collegiate hockey is a lot of fun and interesting. Uh, and you sit right up close to the players. We had a good time. And, of course, the highlight was walking through the hallways as we headed to our seats. And what did we see, Sadie? A picture of mom on the wall. On the of wall course. of Hobie Baker Rink. <laughs> Immortalized in Hobie Baker Rink. There it is. There it I is. I won't say what year it was from, but there's a picture of her on the wall with her name next to it. Exactly. I, I have to say it's a little bit odd because um, I had to be 20 when that picture was taken. I looked like I was 14. You did Those look, were the days. You look very young. There's no question. <laughs> in, but in and my jersey. How often do you get to go to uh, a big time uh, rink or auditorium or uh, or a stadium? As you walk in, you see your mom's photograph displayed in the in the hallway. I would say that's the first time that's happened. <laughs> I would say that's the first time. <laughs> first time, last time. <laughs> it was still have, something. Well, I've ever have I ever seen my dad's picture anywhere? No. No, no. Not so much. Not keep, as much. Keep your eyes open. You, you never know. Uh, all right, uh, we had a good time with that. Um, and Sadie's become a big hockey fan now too. So yeah. well, uh, did you say that Princeton won? Princeton did win that game, uh, one nothing. One yes, nothing. and then they won the next night again against Maine as well. Seven three. They're going to keep playing until Maine makes it close. Yeah. Perhaps we should say that I actually did play ice hockey at Princeton. Oh, why else would your picture be there? Well, I mean, there could be a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the reason. <laughs> but let's, it was there with the rest of the women's team from Samson, you know, those years ago. That's right. Samson, a, uh, a celebrated hockey player of the Princeton women's hockey team. A founding member. Founding member. Founding member. Yes. Defense. Um, Okay, so one thing we do see in the paper this time of year is uh, a lot of memorials. Uh, the Times in the magazine section has a collection of uh, little essays about people who passed away. They have a, even a more in-depth listing of that. 
but we've uh, covered that. Oh, um, oh. <laughs> well, in any event, let me cover this quickly. Then we're going to go to our, our museum up. Yeah, I mean, it's worth going. It's worth buying the New York Times uh, this weekend yeah. because they do have that whole magazine section right. with the interesting little essays. Some of them are a little bit bleak. They're not obituaries per se, but yeah. essays about it's always people, an interesting section uh, who have passed away. Uh, well, 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 you, want, you want to talk about the museum point that you had? And then, no. All right. So let me let me come back to that. Um, the so, uh, but anyway, but we're not going to read all those. No, no, essays no. There allowed. was one obituary that uh, we wanted to. It was just interesting, just a little odd, and. Um, it was the obituary of Audrey Geisel. Audrey Geisel uh, was the widow of Dr. Seuss. Um, some people know Dr. Seuss's real name was Dr. Geisel. Um, Theodore, wasn't it? Yes, Theodore Geisel. And it's kind of an interesting story, and I don't want to dwell on it because it's, it's almost odd, and I don't want to invest too much in any part of it. It is, they do mention in the obituary that it's a little bit of an odd story in that uh, Audrey Geisel was married to another doctor, and uh, her and her husband and the Geisel couple, who were a little bit older, uh, met each other. And uh, she became um, very much attached to Dr. Geisel, and he responded to her. And there was uh, some unpleasantness in that, in fact, uh, the um, Dr. Geisel's wife at the time ended up committing suicide. And, uh, and then uh, Audrey Geisel married Theodore, Audrey married Theodore Geisel, and they got married. So there was a little bit of, of an issue there. Um, but what's interesting, uh, and what's almost hard to explain is that, uh, once, uh, they married, um, uh, Audrey had two daughters, uh, and, uh, two young daughters, uh, I think nine and 11, and she immediately sent them to boring school. And the reason was that, uh, according to the times, at least, I'm sorry, nine and 14 were the age of the daughters. Uh, here's her quote. They, the daughters, uh, wouldn't have been happy with Ted, and Ted wouldn't have been happy with them. Uh, he was afraid of children, she said, especially of their unpredictability, which is odd because he's Dr. Zeus. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, well, I don't think it's odd at all. I think this is crazy that uh, we expect uh, artists... Yeah. Uh, and he was an artist. Yeah. He he can write, He you know, and he will say he would entertain children. He knew how to entertain children. He was just not interested in raising children. Um, and I think that's fine. I think uh, it's fine. you have your niche. Yeah. Uh, he could create uh, great books for children, great books for people, in fact. Does he also have to be um, Dr. Spock in addition to being okay. uh, Dr. Zeus? Uh, no. Um, well, yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it's not a smooth, you know, all American story, uh, where, you know, two people fall in love and get married and, uh, everything's happily ever after. I agree with that, except for this. I mean, it's one thing to say he wasn't that, that into children and he was going to be standoffish or arm's length or whatever it is. It's another thing, for, as she, as described here, it was a big deal for her to send the children away. And she apologized to them after he passed away. It was a big deal. So it was, uh, a real concession to do it. It must have been a serious aversion to the children for her to send the children to boarding school. I think it was a serious aversion of living with children. Okay. All okay. Right. I, I don't think he hated children. I'm not saying he hated children. Okay. okay. Well, in any event. But, and they made a choice. Yes, they did. To live that way. And as a matter of fact, there's also a quote from one of the daughters saying, it was fine. Yes, it you know, was, you're right. I you're wouldn't right. have had it any other way. Okay. And uh, they still had their father. They had their birth father. Right. You know, uh, et cetera. All right. So let's um, move on. Why don't you give us the museum update? Museum update. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. A couple of fun things to be looking for. One is an exhibition of uh, the work of Don Freeman, who's most known as a, an illustrator of children's books, illustrator and author of children's books, including Corduroy. The cute little teddy bear. Um, but in our family, most beloved for writing the book Norman the Dorman, uh -huh. who's the story of a mouse who actually works as a doorman in a museum. 
uh, for the mouse entrance. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was kind of a funny character, and he actually ends up uh, getting an award for some artwork he does. But uh, he was very knowledgeable. It was just fun imagining a mouse scurrying about and appreciating art in a museum. Anyway, his work is at the Museum of the City of New York, always... Uh, a fun museum to go to on the Upper East Side, and uh, I think it'll be there through June. And then there was also an interesting article in the Arts and Leisure section of the New York Times about an exhibition of the work of Anne Brigman, a photographic pioneer. And uh, this exhibition is actually at the uh, Museum of uh, the Nevada Museum of Art. Uh, with a um, an interesting uh, catalog by their senior curator Ann Wolf, and it tells about a pioneer photographer. Ann Brigman was born in 1869 to missionary parents in Hawaii. Okay, I'm uh, just processing that. But yes, yeah. she dies in 1950. Uh, her most famous photographs are from a period around 1900 to 1920. By 1930, she's losing her sight, and she is pretty much done being a professional uh, freelance photographer. Mm -hmm. But she was part of, she was uh, one of the early members of the uh, photo succession movement. Um, She, her work was promoted by Alfred Stiglitz. And there's some sort of uh, intimation in this article that uh, Alfred Stiglitz Diglett's embraced her work almost more so um, than he embraced, um, uh, who am I thinking of, uh, who's the famous painter? I'm having a senior moment. Oh, the Kone? No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the woman. The woman. That what Stiglitz, does she do? Uh, she does the famous... Uh, O'Keefe, George yeah, O'Keefe. Ah, George That's O'Keefe, of course. Right. Right. All right, you got it. Um, so, uh, apologize for that. Anyway, he embraces and tries to promote the work of uh, Brigman. Brigman is a pictorialist mm-hmm. at this point. She's taking kind of fantastic uh, sort of uh, photographs of herself, uh, often in the nude, out in nature. Mm-hmm. Okay, but uh, when she comes to New York and is dealing with Stiglitz and his group, there's kind of a bit of pressure to eroticize all this, and she seems to be seeing it more as uh, being a part of nature, uh, and so she ends up uh, going back to California, and uh, apparently Stiglitz moves on mm-hmm. to O'Keefe and uh, promotes her and her paintings uh, instead. Um, It says, whereas uh, the male photographers of the period might have been trying to celebrate manifest destiny within the age-old conflict of man versus nature, she merely wanted to exist in nature and become one with nature through her body and free spirit. And so these photographs are rather early, as I said, between 1900 1920. She also plays with them, kind of photoshops them. And people were nervous about that Mm -hmm. at that point in photography. We embrace all that kind of, uh, you know, sort of enhancement now. But people were nervous. Is it a real photograph? Is it real art? Is it accurate Uh, if you are... um, you know, a kind of enhancing mm-hmm. uh, these photographs. Uh, so she's quite interesting. Her work is interesting. She may be the first photographer, first female photographer um, to photograph, to do self-portraits in the nude. In America, for sure, perhaps in the world mm-hmm. at that time. Um, the uh, curator of the exhibition seems to feel she's worthy of some kind of movie about her life. Her life doesn't sound all that exciting. Oh, well, let me see the article. I'll look at it later. Um, the, and the photographs are, some of them are, you know, uh, taken in Carmel, you know, by the sea, yeah. you know, those fabulous pines, etc. Um, and she really goes out into the middle of nowhere 
as well before anyone was doing it. You know, we laugh about the photographs at Mohonk with women in high button shoes and big skirts yeah. out hiking. And she's out there, you know. Did the technology exist back then to take a self portrait? Uh, yes. You had like a button it, yes, push or yes, something? Yes, you could, you could gizmo yeah. it together. She also took pictures of her sister. Um, but uh, she took, uh, some of them at least oh. were of herself. But again, all very romantic, not, you know, kind of gauzy, you know, um, playing with the lens, playing mm. with the lighting, oh, etc. All right, so um, let me ask you a question, Sadie. Put you on the spot. What do you think your your car is going to be worth uh, after three years? What percentage of the original value do you think your car will have? Give me a number. I'd say fifty percent. That's a pretty good guess. The average for cars is fifty six percent. So you're in the range. So you say to yourself, "Gee, that's not so great. How I how can I beat that? How can I?" You buy avoid... a Ferrari. No, Ferraris increase in value over time. That may be, but there's a, there's a cheaper way to do it. Uh, let me suggest this: you buy a Vespa, and it turns out that Vespas are pretty much uh, holding value at 72%. As a matter of fact, motor scooters generally are 72%. Vespas, uh, the right model, is 79% at the end of three years. Vespas hold their value. Uh, apparently, Vespas have continued to be uh, con you know, highly uh, valuable and highly desired by people who want motor scooters. And they're trying they to explain why. why. why they is know that? why they don't. I know you have a theory. I know you have a Everyone we know with a Vespa yeah. doesn't ride it. Doesn't ride it. <laughs> They're happy to have the Vespa. They're excited about it. That's... They take it out for a spin very yeah. occasionally, but it's not really getting, you know, a lot of money. There's a girl who doesn't want a Vespa for Christmas right there. I, I, well, I, I get it. Where I would she go? Right. Where would so she that go? I could have a Vespa in my garage like everyone else. You know who we're talking about. All right. Well, in any event... Let's not name names. My point about the Vespa is this. They, they, they try to explain why it holds its value so greatly, even better than other motor scooters. And the answer from a person named Chelsea Lommers, who's the founder of Moto Richmond, which sells these kind of things, is simple. It doesn't have any competition. It's a luxury brand without any competition. Is this just... We're just talking about the U.S.? Yes, we're talking about the U.S. I was going to say, in Italy. It's still huge in Italy. It's still huge in Italy. But in any event, but even in the U.S., in a sense, it does have competition. There are other brands. Uh, there is something made by Yamaha, the, the Vino 50. Honda makes something called the Metropolitan. But they don't really seem to compete with Vespa. Vespa is a step above in a way that there is no car that singularly is the luxury brand. Vespa is, and there's a bunch of reasons for it, but it's, used, it's pretty much the way it's made. There are no plastic parts. It's a unibody. It's made entirely of metal. It's held to a very different standard. It's a very different thing, and these things stay in the road. So much so that they say you can buy a new motor scooter, Chinese, for $2,000. But even if a Vespa costs you $7,000, you're better off buying a Vespa because two years from now you're throwing out the $2,000 Chinese motor scooter but the Vespa will hold its value, and it still has a lot of romance. And they go back to Gregory Peck and Roman Holiday. You need a Vespa, dear. I do not need a Vespa. Think about it. I'm, I'm winning you over. I'm winning you over. I, I can tell. How about you, Sadie? Vespa? There, I have no need nor parking space for a Vespa. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm with the wrong group. Go ahead, Tamsin. Detergents shrink. <laughs> <laughs> to lighten the load for Amazon. You know, this is the thing. Dan always hands me the art articles, the food articles, and the laundry articles. <laughs> the laundry articles. Meanwhile, <laughs> the laundry note part. that in the two years we've been doing this uh, podcast, yeah. there have been no updates on the self-folding laundry machines, right? <laughs> oh, and remember the self-cleaning house? Didn't we talk about the self-cleaning house? So, but, uh, but here, um, so here's one of the things. Um, because now we're buying everything online, Amazon is shipping everything to us, yeah. right? And if it's, if you've got Amazon Prime, it's for free. Amazon is under, you know, Amazon and its uh, retailers are under the gun to ship things more efficiently. Right? 
Right. Yes, absolutely. Which means that, uh, for instance, people want things like laundry detergent, and laundry detergent's pretty darn heavy. I always hate it when I have to buy a new jug of laundry detergent right. and lug it home right. from the grocery store. So Tide, among other companies, Tide and 7th Generation have been working to make uh, more uh, economic Packaging. Right. In fact, Tide now is going to introduce a um, large amount of detergent, uh, um, 150 ounces, will wash the same 96 loads with um, a, a container, a cardboard container that is four pounds lighter mm -hmm. than the curry jug right. uh, it sells it in, okay? And also, not only is it lighter, it doesn't require any packaging. It can be shipped in the cardboard that it is in, just needs a label slapped on the side of oh, it. Oh, wow. That's good. So, I mean, that's uh, good for a lot of reasons in terms of the um, cost of shipping it, but also, you know... Um, Ecologically, right. a lot they're using sixty percent less plastic. I assume there still has to be some kind of plastic bag inside. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it does look a little bit like a box of wine, so you want to be careful that about that and not uh, get those confused. But uh, in addition, uh, seventh generation also has ships in a bottle that looks almost like a um, looks like shampoo. shampoo bottle. Yeah, it looks like shampoo. yeah. Uh, but again. It is a great deal lighter. It is five pounds lighter. It's highly concentrated. Than yes. the, uh, bo the jug they're currently well, look, selling it in. So this is uh, this is a win-win, I would think. Yeah. You, look, that you, it's a more efficient packaging. The problem is if you... They're also, I guess, changing the formulation a little bit. Right. Okay. So that even though it's less detergent, you can wash more loads. Sure. Um, yeah. And uh, so sh you say sure, but people when they go into a grocery store are looking for a big jug. But that's the that that, wash a lot of. But laundry. that's the great thing. Whereas before, you you try to sell people on ecology and say buy the smaller box, and they're still drawn to the bigger box because it displays better and it looks more impressive. But now you've got a whole other reason to buy a smaller smaller box, all, a whole other reason to support ecology. And you're saying to them, look, we'll ship this to you, we'll get the job done, and we can do it economically. That's that. That's a winning strategy, and that's going to win. also why you buy Tide Pods? Because yeah. the pods are just smaller, concentrated things, and you just put one pod in, well, and it's a lot lower volume than... I, I think so, but I think what we're going to say is this... Look, I'm not going to say that trend doesn't exist. There always already is some appeal to getting smaller products, but this is going to enhance that. A lot of products are going to get smaller just because they're going to be designed to be shipped, not to be seen. At well, the but, but I think, again, it's mm -hmm. the idea of the bricks and mortar store. Yeah. You know, there are certain things that sell you in person. Right. There are other things that may sell you in theory yeah. online, and you're perfectly willing to buy into that if you're not... Right. Seeing it, if you're not walking down it makes the per aisle. perfect sense. It's it's the future, dear. It's D the future. The future is here. Yeah. So speaking of the future is here, and this we're going to end with this story, but this is mind-boggling to me. Maybe you guys were all into this. You knew all about it. It's about flying cars. Dan Neal is the car reviewer for the Wall Street Journal. We talked about him before, and he... we we heard something about this before that people are saying, you know. You really thought we'd have flying cars by now. Well, you know something? Why do we not have flying cars? It's because of the government. Here's the here's the answer. We do have flying cars. So he Dan Neal test drives the Kitty Hawk, a startup backed up by a Google co-founder Larry Page. Now, let's explain what we're talking about. These are called aeromobiles, or aeros for short. What is an aero? An aero is a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, or a VTOL. Um, they are like helicopters, but they are successors to helicopters. Helicopters are too noisy, and efficient, polluting, and expensive for mass scale use. These are lighter, they're quieter, they have zero operational emissions, and they're pretty much supposed to ultimately operate like flying cars, quiet enough to operate in the cities without disturbing the neighbors. And how close are they to being here? Very close. Neil explains in his article, as he says, here's a fun fact. Many of, of these vehicles carry as many as six passengers, and there will be no controls on board. So going around the room, how do we feel about that? 
He had to res. I don't know about that. How, how does that work? It's uh, there's some central uh, computer that that guides everything, and uh, they have some emergency jumping. Is that like the whole driverless cars? Thing? Is it fits in right with the driverless? Maybe cars. you drive it with your phone. No, no, you don't. You don't. It fits in the driverless cars. Look, he does a test drive, and he he talks about his experience, and he's able to maneuver this way and that way. He's in a prototype. It's an early model. But what's really amazing to me is, and here's how you know it's going to happen. I mentioned that there's this Kitty Hawk, which is a new venture where Larry Page is behind it. But they already have competition. There's something that Uber has put together a vehicle uh, that's pictured here. Uh, it's called the Aero Taxi. There's something called the Aero Limo, which is manufactured by Rolls Royce. Uh, are these been, prototypes or these? These are, are prototypes. Okay. Something by Aston Martin has done something. Something by a company called Lilium. There are already a bunch of competitors making these. Depending on who's, who's uh, uh, um, right up your reading, they're going to be available in three years or five years or seven years, and they're going to be on the market. And as he points out in his article, they're pretty much here. There is only one technical issue, and it's not like it's a non-issue, but it's one that can be solved. They all can do with better battery power, and that's always been a limiting factor in some degree. Battery technology has to catch up. But those solid states are expected to be ready soon enough. He, so as he sums it up, when is the future? Um, the future is uh, is now. Arrows already work like a charm. It's only paper that keeps them grounded. The FAA, the Federal uh, Aviation Administration, hasn't figured out how to regulate these. And it's going to take them years to figure out. That's the choke point. That's the limiting factor. Well, visually... Well, it's, I can't it, imagine it. It's a lot to figure out, but it's going to be figured out. But technically, they're almost here. How are you going to stay in your lane? Uh-huh. Well, a couple things. Yeah. First of all, I have a friend who has a two-year-old, and she was told, I forget by who, but someone authoritative, that her two-year-old will never never have to learn to drive because by that point, everyone will have driverless cars. Right. And it'll probably be like an option to learn to drive, but you probably won't have to drive by the time he's 16. Second point is I know for a fact that the Department of Transportation is trying to get a hold or get their grasp on driverless cars and figure out how to deal with all of the data that driverless cars process all the all day, every day. So right. trying to create some sort of um, universal or federally managed data system that is managing all of that, all of the data that cars are producing and... Um, I guess, sharing these days. Well, so I know that I feel like that's the walking point and then the flying cars is the running point. Right. So trying to figure out how to manage the data that they've never even had to deal with before and doing it, doing it in a way that, you know, everyone can use whatever the federal process is instead of having, you know, Honda using one system and um, Audi using another system and whatever. Right. I, look, I, I, that makes entire sense, but it seems to me in five, six, seven years, you're going to have four companies competing all with a car that works like a flying car just waiting for the takeoff signal from the FAA. Well, it sounds like we're the winners in this scenario, yes, don't you? It sounds like fun. It sounds like the Jetsons is what it sounds like. And on that note, we're going to leave you <laughs> with a little Jetson music. And uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Yes. Uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. From uh, Tamsin. And Dan. Reading the newspaper. We'll see you again next week. Next year. Thanks.